day two. Hey, we want to welcome you here to the Safety Week Casino. Thank you for coming out as we start our celebration of uh, this body of believers being together for 100 years. Praise the Lord for that. Um, the, the carrying on that uh, has taken place. Uh, standing on the shoulders. Standing on what the, the foundations that have been laid before us. Uh, being entrusted to us to, to maintain and to increase uh, that work. And uh, it's, it's humbling, but it's good because it's God's work. And God has carried it out for us. And so if you'd stand with us and we sing a few songs, let's go before Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we adore you, glorify you. We come now as, as a people to celebrate the work you've done here for 100 years. The faithfulness, the loyalty, the commitment, the hard work, the joy, the hardship, the pain, the struggle. Uh, Father, we thank you for carrying us, carrying this body through it all. But it is your work, and it's the work of your Holy Spirit that has done these things. It is the, the joy of serving Jesus Christ and preaching his name, that all that hear his name will come to know him and be in a right relationship with you, O oh God. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. As we stand before you, as we sing, as we hear your word, hear parts of the history this place, Lord. May we be encouraged. May we be challenged uh, to rise up as men and women of God, serving the one true God. You are good and you are holy. May we glorify as we join our voices together to praise Him, Lord. Jesus. Amen. Scripture, 
and it means us. We can have that life abundantly. It says, whosoever believeth in me shall have eternal life, right? And that means us. That means me. Uh, not, not somebody else. Not, well, somebody else too, but also just me. Amen.
on those streets, to be there in your presence, Jesus. We thank you for the hope that is found in you. To be made right with our Heavenly Father. To be empowered by your Holy Spirit. We praise you, we adore you, we thank you for the invitation. May each person hear that invitation in their heart. May each person respond with a whole yes. Yes, Lord. Save me. Forgive me. Lord, may our hearts always be ready to obey you and love and glorify you. We praise you and thank you. You are so good, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now we got a history line. Bruce Martin. Anytime I get to stand behind James Menzies' pulpit, I'm going to take advantage of that. Legend has it that he built this anyway. They say if you come through the church at night, it has a little bit of a glow to it. <laughs> but I didn't dare stand behind it. <laughs> We're glad you're here, and I've got really one main thing to say. To God be the glory. It's not what we have done, it's what God has done through people, as our theme is, uh, people that have said yes to God. And so, you know, it's, it's not us that goes back to Him, and that's that's where, where the honor needs to be given. But, spiritual battlegrounds. I'd say they're everywhere. They're, they're here today. They're in our homes. Uh, most of the time we like to think that we're winning. Uh, sometimes we know we're losing. But, a hundred years ago, 110 years ago, I think the Christians that were in this area knew that they were losing. The Kentuckians were complicated people. They had seen a great move of God through that part of America in, in the early, mid-1800s. Uh, but also, with that, they were the first settlers in this area, uh, and, and some logging camp people. But they also brought with them, uh, I guess I would call some, some questionable habits as well. Uh, a while back, somebody gave me some information from Poplar. Some of you know where Poplar is, it's northwest of Iroways, and it was settled pretty early. But along with those notes was um, uh, the places to get the best whiskey and casino was listed. Two, two individuals anyway that were very good at their trade. Uh, and that was kind of a little bit of that early environment. Yeah, there, there was a smattering of Christians here and there, but um, it was a tough place. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of where we were at as a community. Um, we had one main building. Uh, there was never a town here, but there was a community building called the Whitman Hall. Uh, it was the first one was a log hall just across the road from here. And, you know, it was a, there was good things that happened there too. They would have farm meetings, insurance meetings, boxing matches. Uh, but the main thing was, it was uh, uh, the site of a dance hall, and although there was never a license to sell liquor there, it was kind of known as a place where that could be exchanged anyway, out back. And so that was what the families were up against here in this area. Arvid King's writer's book talks about three women. I'm sure there was more than three. Uh, but he lists three women that prayed in a church. Uh, 
It did start at Casino. Uh, there's a, an article from the Motley Mercury on the corner of my farm just down the road here. There was a school named Taft School, and uh, the Methodists from Motley came out, held meetings, and actually had a very good response. Um, several people were baptized over in Rock Lake. Uh, they had 40 people that signed up to be members for the Casino Methodist Church. What happened, I don't know, but it fizzled, did not go, and the mothers that were praying in a church uh, realized it wasn't gonna go, so. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, probably 1919, 1920, a famous evangelist, Pentecostal evangelist, that traveled the whole country, uh, was having meetings in a place called McKeesport, Pennsylvania, and afterwards, a couple of young men came up to Ben Harden. Um, one of them was kind of heir to a, uh, he's just 19, 20 years old at the time, but heir to a uh, milk bottling business in that city. Uh, and the other one worked for them. They came up and they said, where we feel like we're called into the ministry, where is God needed the worst in the United States? Where is the roughest place? You know what I'm gonna say. Ben Harden said, Northern Minnesota is the roughest place that I've been to in my travels. I'm sure they prayed and deliberated. And I would call Jim Menzi the un prodigal son. He had a business that he would have inherited, but he took a bunch of the money that he had saved and had coming to him, invested in a large tent, and took this young man named Frank, Frank Lindquist with him. Ben Harden told him, Jim, you do the preaching because Frank Lindquist is no preacher, he, but he's, he's a pretty good song maker. Well, it wasn't too many years later, Frank Lindquist had the biggest full gospel tabernacle in the upper Midwest. But Jim Menzi went on and did great things as well. But they came here, landed in, in perhaps Staples, Brainerd, they were having meetings in the area. The Barnett sisters, and I've never heard it called this, but that's who they were. One was married to George Horn. One was married to a Bryant in Staples. They were talking, and uh, the Bryant sister uh, said, you know, they're having these great meetings here in Staples. Let's see if they'll come out to casino. Because she had heard about um, her sister's problems <laughs> with the 10 sons and one daughter. And some of them were making some progress, but others were being led the wrong direction. So out he came. It was in November. It was too late for a tent meeting. They had some meetings up here at the Sunrise Schoolhouse. But they really didn't do much. But he said, I'll come back. The next summer in June. Right in the woods down here, just south of the church, a tent was put up. And years later, James Menzi would say that in all my years of ministry, I never saw the Holy Spirit fall like it did on that night in June of 1922. This is recorded by my great aunt Mabel, some of the, the things that went on, but God moved and people made changes. Um, but of course, with that comes adversity. And most of you heard, have heard about 
the Woodman Hall. It was, like I say, I'm sure there were some good people there too, but um, well, they kind of joked a little bit about the, the church was kind of taking the, the girls away um, from the Woodman Hall at the dances. And some of them weren't too happy about that. And so acid was thrown on the tent. Damaged the piano. The, the tent was beyond repair, and uh, parts would be taken off of vehicle vehicles so that they wouldn't start and that type of thing. Uh, but the the new Christians dug in their heels and said, "We're going to build a church." And that fall, they started on that. Some land was given just right, just a quarter mile to the east here, and uh, they began work on it. And the church went up. The first, who, who was first, you know, it always talks about that, but I will say, you know, I don't believe that, don't let this go to rain, but I don't believe we were first. But we were the first church that was built for the Assemblies of God. And it's because, you know, they rented a, a building in Brainerd, but uh, this one was built from scratch out here. And, People sacrificed, got it up before winter, and uh, the church was up and going. Jim Menzi was pastoring with Frank in Brainerd. Uh, why did he come all the way out here? The crowds were in Brainerd. Um, but we had one thing that Brainerd didn't have, and that was a little, little blonde Swedish girl lived right over here. That, uh, he ended up marrying a anyway, named Agnes Peterson. And so he he was our first pastor and uh, uh, things were all up and running. The first board, two Georges and two Raymonds. George Ackerson and George Horn were the two horns. Um, got a couple actresses, Jim and Julie, if you'd raise your hand. Uh, they are here. And Jim's grandpa uh, was one of the original board members. George Horn, I uh, think we got horns in just about every service, but I don't happen to see you any right now. I'll get your hand up if you would if you're here. But uh, anyway. They've gone on and um, great traditions in those families. Ellen Johnson, Ellen Ackerson Johnson was um, George's daughter, married the Brainerd pastor a couple years later. And uh, from that union was three of um, some of the most sought after evangelists in our George Horn, Helen Horn was his only daughter, 10 boys and one girl, and she pastored here uh, and did preaching all over in the 40s and 50s as well, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Raymond Martin, there's two Raymonds, Raymond Ackers, or Raymond Horn never did um, marry, uh, but taught Sunday school here for many years and was on the board. And even in 1962, on the 40th, uh, he, did, he was on the board, so he was on, I would say, for, for at least 40 years and probably more. Raymond Martin, his grandson, Jim, where are you at? Jim Martin came all the way from uh, Kansas to be here anyway, and uh, his, his, his grandfather was one of those original board members anyway. His daughter, Avis, went into the ministry and, and preached down in Missouri for many years. So, tomorrow night, we're going to pick it up uh, in the late 20s. The Woodman Hall, for some reason, was kind of going downhill. And they thought, well, maybe if we build a new building, here comes a horn right here. Maybe if we build a new building, perhaps maybe that'll help. Uh, 
So we'll see if it did. We'll pick it up tomorrow night um, and go into the God Wall era and some other things. See you then.
Yes, sir. Hey, man. Long job. Okay, so, uh, anybody have a testimony of uh, what God's been doing in their life? Whether it's history here at Casino or just in general. Shout hallelujah if you love Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So I get the honor of being a, a teacher and a coach over at Pillager Schools. And today at practice, one of the seniors came up to us and goes, Coach, is it okay if we go pray at midfield after the game? And uh, as like a school person, I can't uh, endorse, but I said, I'm not going to stop you, and I'm definitely telling you yes. Just go. Um, so it's really cool. Pillager's had a couple tough things happen here in the last couple weeks. And uh, the kids are banded together and they're banded together on that. Anybody else? I'm Jen Barton, now loved me for 30 years, but um, I'm just going to echo that with what Ben had said, right, Ben? Okay, I'm going to echo that. Our son, Jake, teaches in St. Francis. He's a high school math teacher. And I'm going to get choked up here. He sent a text this morning saying that it's his fourth year teaching there. That he had a dream come true this morning. They started a fellowship of Christian athletes. And it's meeting in Jake's room. And as a high school teacher, he's like, that's something I've dreamed about since I was in high school. And we had FCA in one of our teacher's rooms. And so it was just kind of cool today to see that come full circle for him attending it as a student for so many years, and now it's meeting in his classroom. So um, our schools are, are seeing it, and it's pretty cool. Amen. Since we're on the football thing, uh, we have a new coach at Winona State, and he's an extremely strong Christian, and he's just amazed me. He had all of us campus pastors come over and tell the players after practice when our meetings are, and before we did that, he got up, and I've never heard anyone at Winona so cold. He said, you know that our theme is faith, family, and football, in that order, and you know that my faith is in Jesus Christ, and he has saved I mean, it wasn't just in God, it was in Jesus Christ, and I want you guys to really embrace your faith while you're in college, so these are the ways that you can, and it's just been just amazing. So we've had football players come into Chi Alpha and come to a small group, unlike ever before, we've been feeding them a big meal, we feed all 120 of them. Uh, Chi Alpha does every year at the beginning of football camp. But it hasn't translated into a lot of them coming until this year. Most of you know that Gina, uh, our daughter in law, was in an accident. And uh, she's doing well, but she'll be down uh, for a long time. Uh, <coughs> I think we're very thankful that she survived that head on the back. And we appreciate each one of you that have been praying. I know Pastor has been uh, mentioning it in services. And, and we appreciate it. And thank you that God is doing the work.
I brought a few Kleenex with me tonight. Because I have a, an emotional streak that won't split. When uh, Bruce wrote me a text or an email, I can't remember which, I've got a long list of texts from him, and said, we're having the 100th anniversary, and we'd like to have you there. I'll tell you, it was a flood of emotion. To think that 55 years later, that I might come back and see some of the same people that I loved when I was here. Uh, I don't know if you can appreciate that, but it thrills me to be here. I am, I am honored beyond words. When Bruce called me, I had a, a sermon that was, that I preached a few times, and I dug that out and I said, that's, I'm going back to casino with that, it's a barn burner. <laughs> but you know, the interesting thing is, I sat in front of him. Now, if I feel, if I look a little nervous, I really am because I'm out of practice. I do a few funerals now and then, but not much else. And I haven't publicly spoken much since probably 2007. So I'm a little out of practice. So it's going to take me a few minutes to get warmed up here. So if you bear with me, we'll be, do, we'll be doing all right. But anyway, I. I sat down with this barn burner of a sermon that I had called, What's in Your Hand? And I thought, I'm going to take that back to the casino. Because it had worked pretty good for me for a few times in the past. So I thought, well, it maybe work for me again because, you know, when you're out of practice, you've got to use something that you can rely on. You know what I mean? Well, excuse me, but... Uh, I sat down to my computer and I was going to edit this a little bit and I, I couldn't use it, couldn't use it. And I prayed, Lord, what in the world am I going to do? I, I really didn't, honestly didn't know what I was going to do. So I just kind of set it up on the shelf for a while and waited. Now this all started back, I think Bruce Brooke contacted me in December or January, something like that. And when I, I would work in my shop and I would say, Lord, now what am I, what am I supposed to do? You know, I've been given this honor, what am I supposed to do? So one day, on a Sunday afternoon, I sat down at my computer, and we're going to go through what I believe God put in my heart. Now, I will tell you, warn you ahead of time, that since I've only been allotted three hours, <laughs> I really had to trim this back. Well, I know what you're saying to yourself. Uh, you're probably saying, uh, yeah, you take three hours, you'll never come back again. <laughs> probably what you're thinking. Well, don't worry, it's only been two hours and 55 minutes. <laughs> I, I really don't know how long it's going to take. We might be here all night, who knows. But at any rate, I'm not very good at telling jokes. You can probably already tell that. But before I go any farther, does anybody recognize the name Inga Sams? Nobody. Okay. That's okay. You don't have to. Uh, we've looked all over the history. Now, I, I am convinced that I saw a picture of her in the 1992 bulletin. You know, we can't find it. 
just can't find it. So just remember the name. I'm not going to preach to you tonight. I'm going to tell you a story. And, I, and the idea came to me when I remembered 1993 going to Lake Geneva Bible Camp. And Iris Stanfield was there. I admired Iris Stanfield. It is no secret what God can do. You know that. What he's done for others. You do for you. Well, at any rate, Ira didn't preach that night. He told his story. And the story was not a story of all victory. It was a story of dis disturbing results in his life. Things that happened that hurt. Things that happened that seemingly brought the end of life. And yet... He trusted God and God continued to bless him. And I was so impressed by Ira's talk that night. And as I began to think about tonight, I said, you know what? We're going to talk about how God has moved and directed and used and blessed and comforted me. And I hope before we quit tonight, this will have touched your heart. Because life is not all on the mountain. It's not all living up here. But as Linda Rundle, I believe that's the song singer, she sings the song, the God of the day is also God of the night. And the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. So we serve a wonderful God. We really do. Well, let me run through a few things I learned when I first came here. Many of you remember, remember Uncle Archie Crock. Well, under the direction of Uncle Archie, one of the first things I learned is to run through a cornfield at night without a flashlight and a stick and a gunny sack <laughs> looking for snipes. <laughs> you know what? I actually did that. I knew better. Well, I thought it was a practical joke for a long time until one night I was looking on the internet and I don't know why, but I just typed in the word snipes. Well, I found out Archie running through the cornfield at night's not going to produce any valuable result. And if you want snipes, you've got to go to the lowlands and you've got to bag them with a shotgun. They actually do exist. Yeah, they really do. Well, the year was 1967. Kenneth Freeheit was our district super secretary. Called me and said, Are you, there's a little church up near Brainerd. And I really think it would be good if you would consider talking to them and maybe candidating. I said, Okay, what do I do next? And he made a couple of phone calls. And a couple of weeks later, an invitation was given, and I drove my 65 Rambler up Highway 10 into Motley, and I got up here to the corner of, I forgot what the highway number is, and there was a little sign on the, on the corner that said, Casino Assembly of God, that way. So we turned, drove up here, and here it stood on the corner of this road, a little tiny white building that I called home for about four or five years. I don't remember exactly. Pretty close. I was green. I mean, I was green. I didn't know anything except milk and cows feeding pigs. 
working on tractors, cutting hay, baling hay, that's all I knew. But I'd gone to North Central Bible College and Ken Freeheim thought I would do okay. Well, we enjoyed ourselves. And I knew while resting that Sunday afternoon that this is where we belong. There was no doubt in my mind that this is where we belong. And I didn't know what God had in store for my life. I had no idea. I just knew this is where I was supposed to be. So the congregation voted and they said, would you come back? And I said, I'll be there. And we came. I learned that faith is something you have to build. It's not something that comes to you through osmosis. It's not something that comes to you because your neighbor did you a good deed, but it comes to you by reading the Word, studying the Word, praying, and paying attention to what God says in the Word. You have to build your faith, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And if we leave it out, if we don't take it in that order, it doesn't build. But we must build our faith. It's a gift of God, but we must first believe. We must recognize that we're sinners. And every one of us here, we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. But like the song says, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Okay? God is the giver of that salvation. Secondly, faith is a recognition that God is our only real source. You have to think about that a minute. Not often do we think God is our real source. We kind of think we're doing pretty good on our own. But God is our source. Paul wrote in Philippians, third chapter, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is in faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God is by faith. So we build our faith, we build our whole lives based on faith. Now, as we ponder that, I want to take you back to the Old Testament. There's a guy in the Old Testament that we've heard about ever since Sunday school. His name is Moses. Now, in Exodus, the third chapter, God appears to Moses and spends basically the whole third chapter explaining who he, God, is to this fellow by the name of Moses. Do you know who Moses was? Don't know who Moses was? Moses. Who was Moses? He was, he was that criminal in Pharaoh's court, remember? He killed the Egyptian, then he ran away. Boy, I'm not catching on here. Anyway, God spent the whole third chapter basically explaining to Moses who he was, who God was. Okay? Then, as we, let me turn the page here. Oh, that's right. At the end of the third chapter, he said, and Moses, I'm going to use you to accomplish my task. Well, how would you like it if all of a sudden somebody told you what the next 40 years of your life is going to be like? I'm not too sure that I want to know, but... I can look back and see what it was like. But God told Moses, you're going to be the one to lead my people out of Israel. And Moses did the very thing that so many of us will do. He asked a faithless question. He said, what if I go back to Pharaoh and tell him what you told me to tell him? And he says, and I go back to the Israelites and I tell them. And what if they said, well, God never sent you. We don't believe you. What, you. what am I going to do? And, and I don't know if we still do this or not, but when I was a youngster in Sunday school, 
we had something called object lessons. And they'd pull it and grab it out of a hat or a pencil on a, I don't know, they did all kinds of things. But they demonstrated scripture through object lessons. Well, God did the same thing to Moses right now. He said, Moses, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, well, it's a rock. And God says, throw it on the ground. And when he threw it on the ground, it became a snake. And Moses, of course, he didn't have any faith, or not much. But God says, reach around and pull it by the tail. And when he did, it became a rod again. But the thing I want you to notice, the question God said to Moses is, what is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? When I first came to this congregation, I, th I, I thought I had faith. I thought, you know, I've just come out of Bible school. I, I'm, I'm a strong Christian. I, I know what it's like to, to pray and to read and to study. I've got faith. I, I just went to Bible school. Well, I didn't know a thing about trusting God. When I went back, I really didn't. But I began to learn. And it became a lifelong journey. And I'm going to share some of that with you. My goal tonight is that I would like you to see that the most in the most unexpected ways, God moves, He leads. And he gives, and we need to be ready and not question when he does. I'd like to share some of my journey with you, and it may get pretty emotional at times because much of it is still very strong. I still feel much of it when I think about it. But I want to share it with you because... It hasn't all been easy, but God has given some very blessed times as well. He didn't give me a 40-year plan. There were some very low valleys to walk through. But as I look back, there were also have been some very rewarding times. The congregation here at Casino was small. Our church budget was small. The building was small. Our thinking was small. <coughs> but I'll tell you, the people were great. Every Sunday morning, there was a little door in the corner of the building, as you probably, many of you probably remember, that led down to the basement. Every Sunday morning, the people would bring eggs and butter and meat. Leave it on the ledge, Brother Pastor. If we needed milk, all I had to do was walk across the road over here at Calvin Martin's milk house and dip out the amount we needed. I'll tell you, God takes care of his people. Every fall, the, the church members and the men of the church would bring their wagons and tractors and chainsaws, and we'd go out to Alvin Martin's woods and we'd cut red oak. Boy, oh, would we cut red oak. And we'd pile it up outside here and we'd have heat for the parsonage and heat for the church all winter long. I'll tell you, God's people know how to take care of His. Family. Every once in a while, I'd drive into a, we would, we'd go visit a family in the church, and we always came home with <coughs> something. They took care of us. Every once in a while, I'd visit one of the farmers during the day, and, 
hey, back up here to my gas barrel, I'll fill your car with gas. <laughs> I'll tell you, God's people know how to take care of their own. While I was here, there was a need that was greater financially than what the church could handle. But they gave me freedom. I taught high school in Pillager, 7 through 12 industrial arts. That was a great time. In the summertime, I would work for Anderson Gravel and we, I fed rock, rock and gravel into the rock crusher and we crushed the rock and made gravel and made sand for the state and did, did those things in the summertime. And all these things meant a need. But there was something burning in the back of my mind that wouldn't go away. While I was in Bible school, <coughs> I had been, I had pretty much determined that I wanted to be a missionary pilot. I wanted to be one of these guys that goes into the bush and flies missionaries and other people, sick people. You've all read about it, I'm sure. Uh, Missionary Aviation Fellowship is one of the groups. And I didn't know how I was ever going to do that. It was, it seemed way out of reach. But I had determined that. I don't think I was called to do it. Especially now when I look back. And I don't know if you know who the Aka Indians are, but in 1958, I believe it was, there was a missionary pilot or a couple of missionaries killed by the Aka Indians in South America. And that story influenced me. But the greater need that I had and the thing that was in the back of my mind is how will I go to aviation school? I don't have any money. How do I do this? Well... I scouted Moody Bible Institute because they have a program for aviation missionaries. But I wasn't smart enough to pass their math exam, so they wouldn't take me. They're a tuition-free school. I thought that'd be a good idea, you know, if I could go there. Well, I needed two years of ministry to even qualify for missionary aviation ministry. Well, the time we spent here fulfilled that, but Lord, how are we going to ever become missionary pilots? Didn't know. Didn't know. <clears throat> well, I didn't even know where I was going to go to school. But some, one day somebody gave me a book. And I don't even remember the name of the book, but it was about a missionary aviation pilot mechanic who was killed in Papua New Guinea flying. He, his airplane crashed because somebody made a mistake on his airplane and he caught fire while in the air and he crashed. But the story is he went to Spartan School of Aeronautics. And I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't know if I can handle this one. I'm, I'm not strong enough to have faith enough for this. That costs money. Well, I didn't have any money, but I believed God would supply me. I believed that he would take, if that's what I was supposed to do, I believe he would bring supply. A phone call came one day. And most of you will know the name Rudy. Rudy called me one day and said, I want you to work in my shop. I want you to, I want you to come down and, and run my shop. He said, I've got more work than I can handle. I don't have time to do it. There's no strings attached. Just you come down here and accomplish the work that I'm not able to do. You keep the money that you make. You 
pay your own bills. There, you can use the shop, you can use my tools, you can use whatever's here, but help me get this work done. I don't know. How, do you, how would you respond to something like that? I mean, here's an opportunity. What have I got in my hand? The only thing I really seriously know how to do is to fix tractors and fix cars and, and do those kind of things. That's all I really know how to do. Yes, I'm a pastor, but at the same time, I know how to do these things. <coughs> That's what I had in my hand. That's all I had in my hand. Plus the faith that God may well be leading me to do what I'm asked to do. December 1970, I was accepted at Spartan School of Aeronautics. Not only did I have the money to move to Tulsa, I had enough money to live on for two months. I had two full years of tuition to pay in advance. I say praise God. Friends, if God wants you to do something, he's going to make a way. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. If God impresses on you to do something, don't back away because he will give you the ability and the provision with which to do what it is he's asked you to do. He will. Not only that, but a friend of mine, a classmate of mine from North Central Bible College was living in Tulsa, and he found us a house to rent before we ever got there. I believe God was opening the door. I still see the hand of God. I really do. I started school, started day classes, because I hadn't yet found a job. And one day the pastor of the local assembly that we were attending came by to visit my wife and son. Oh, by the way, let me share this with you. Did, uh, many of you probably don't know. My son was born in Wadena 55 years ago this Friday. I was, I was chopping corn in Calvin's field, and, and Gail came rushing out to the field and said, you better get home, you're going to be a dad. So I ran home, and, we, and my son was born the 16th of September, 1967. And that's a little side note. But the pastor came over and, and visited with my son and wife, and I don't think anything was said about finances, but I'm, I can't be sure, but I don't think it was. And Sunday morning, we were sitting in church, and the pastor said, we have a young couple here who are preparing for the mission field. And he said, folks, I really think we need to help them. So he they took out the offering plates and I stuck my hand in my pocket to see what I could give. And the pastor introduced my wife and I. Friends, I can't tell you how much money that they gave us, but it helped us through. It met a need. And it's just one more thing that said to me, Lord, this, this is what you want me to do. My first daughter was born when we lived in Tulsa. And I, soon after that, I took a job at John Deere and became one of their mechanics and then moved to night school. But two years after entering Spartan and graduating, I got what could be Devastating news. My wife 
wife said to me, I don't want to be a missionary wife, and if you want to do this, find somebody else to do it with. Now that will make you run to the valley in a hurry. As a matter of fact, you'll probably trip a few times going down here. I said, Lord, what is going on? What is wrong? What am I doing wrong? Why? What is happening? This, this whole thing was given to me. I didn't pay for it. And now, are you taking it away? What's happening? And all I can do is go to prayer and just say, Lord, I, I do not understand. But I trust you. I have nothing else to say. Nothing at all. Well, we moved from Tulsa to Bemidji, and I lived on a farm right next to my folks for about two years. And things were going well. I had a good job. I worked working for a case dealer, and I was the top mechanic there. I mean, I, I, by that I mean highest paid. I don't mean best. I mean, I think I was best, but you know how that goes. He was paying me more than anybody else, so that said something. Anyway, I, had, I was, I mean, it was, life was good. We were out of debt. I was feeding my family. You know, things were going well. And one day I got a call for, from Harley Olson in the Wisconsin District of the Assemblies of God. <clears throat> but before that, I want to tell you something. I really, I, I really thought life was good, but there were times when things were a little bit rough. And one day, you know, you know, you know. Sometimes when things are going too good, we kind of drift away from our service to God. Have you ever noticed that in your life? You know, if things are going along really good, we start trusting in me instead of in the Lord. You ever had that happen to you? Well, I think it was probably happening to me because I was really feeling comfortable working there. I was right next to my folks, you know, and living in northern Minnesota, which I love, and one day at work, I had a, and, and I'm actually, don't know how all this happened, but I, I, I had a big old growth happen in my, under my kneecap, just all of a sudden. It was so bad, I wound up coming home from work early, and no matter how I, I approached it, laying down, sitting down, Standing up didn't matter. It was immensely painful. So the best I could do was lay down in bed and prop my leg up on the pillow. Kevin was in kindergarten. He was our oldest son. Came home from kindergarten and he saw me laying in bed and he said, Dad, what, what's wrong? And I showed him. He said, Daddy, can we pray? five, seven years old, something like that, he prayed a simple prayer. A simple childlike prayer. Friends, I got up and went to work the next morning. That day went away. I praise God. It was not long after that that Harley Wilson called me and said, uh, want to know if I'd be willing to take a look at a small church in Northern Wisconsin. I said, yes. What do we do next? So Harley made some phone calls. Two weeks later, we candidated. Two weeks later, I told my boss we were going to move to Ashland. And I was going to take a position as a pastor there. Now, I didn't know why 
I couldn't explain why to my boss. I couldn't explain to him why we were going. I had no idea, except I knew for a fact, I knew within my heart, God was saying, go. That's all I had, nothing else. Because that's all I had in my hand, was faith that God could lead and would lead in the way that he does. Well, that morning, I stood behind the pulpit, and here are seven people in the congregation, and two of those are children, and I have five. There's five. It's a 12 congregation morning. Well, that wasn't really encouraging, but I still knew that's where I was supposed to go. So, now what, Lord? Do I go or do I stay? Go. So I went. And because a congregation that small is not very well equipped, especially when five of them are retired. The two children aren't working, five of the members are retired. There's not much income here at all. So I took a job at the John Deere dealer and worked there for two years and then got laid off. The economy just went south and was laid off. <coughs> Lord, what do we do now? I didn't qualify for unemployment because at that time, anyway, pastors, if you were pastor of the church, and even if you did have another job, you didn't qualify because you already had a job. You don't qualify. So, the only thing I could do is say, Lord, now what? You didn't bring us here to forget about us. You didn't bring us here to leave us alone. You didn't bring us here to embarrass us. And I can't remember how all the things that I'm going to share with you transpired or the specific instances that increased my faith. But I was asked by, one day by the Catholic priest to lead a group of people from his congregation in a study in the Holy Spirit. The people would be from his congregation. The Catholic Church was not going to sponsor the study, but it would be held in a classroom at the local college. And we went on this way for some time, and I really, I don't know why this happened, but I didn't get to know the people really, really close. There was something about it that prevented me, I don't know what it was, honestly I don't know, but there was no, I didn't know everybody and each person's situation. But there was a time when our money ran out, literally. The groceries ran out, and I remember praying, and I'm going to quote to you what I prayed. God, I've told no one but you about our situation. I didn't believe it was my place to go blabbing to the neighbors or even the church members about this difficult situation we were in because God brought us to Ashland. And if God brought us to Ashland, then it was his obligation to take care of us. Would you not agree? You don't agree? I'm sure you do. The next one morning we were feeding the children the last of the cereal and the last of the milk and drinking the last of the coffee. And the doorbell rang. A lady appeared at the door when I opened it, and she said, Are you Theodore Jensen? I said, Yes, ma'am. And she only knew me as Pastor Jensen. She, I don't think she ever knew my first name. And here's the story she told me. She said, We received a phone call from a lady in Dallas this morning. This lady in Dallas used to live in Ashland. And this lady in Dallas said, Do you have a minister in your town by the name of Theodore Jensen? 
This is a lady in Dallas asking the lady in Ashland. And the lady in Ashland says, I think we do. And the lady in Dallas said, okay, I've been praying this morning and the Lord told me that you are to take so much money and go to the grocery store and you are to buy groceries, this many dollars worth of groceries, and you are to bring them to Theodore Jensen's house. I can't help but get excited, folks. I don't know, but those groceries were like the cruise of oil that lasted until the famine was over. God does take care of his own. Saying, don't complain. There, there is a saying, I should say, that, that goes like this, and I've seen it on bumper stickers, and you probably have too. It says, don't complain about food or farmers with food in your mouth. Now think about that for a minute. How many times do we have food in our mouth and we say, we are? <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, I'll tell you, don't complain about the farmers if you've got food in your mouth. Now, also, there's a scripture that says, well, I'll put a little bit before it. It says, don't complain about things when you're full of the joy of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, if you're full of the joy of the Lord, you don't have time to complain. You don't have room to complain. Because you can't complain from the same mouth that rejoices, you can't do it. And Paul said rejoice. And again I say rejoice. And the joy, my friends, is in the rejoicing. When you're rejoicing, you're going to have joy. It isn't going to take long for it to get there. And there's not going to be much room for complaining. Another time, I have to tell you this, we were down to a quart of oil, a quart of oil, a quart of milk and a, and a cake mix. That's all we had. Literally, that's all it was. We held service on Sunday night. And as customary, we would stand at the back of the church and visit with the people. The church is growing by now. We would stand back there and we'd greet folks and talk to them and check on their week and their day and so on. And everybody left except John Anderson and his wife and three children. Well, John and his wife stood there talking long enough that I said to myself, there's something more here than just John wanting to talk. John was from a neighboring church. I had worked on his, his logging equipment, making it run so he could use it for logging when I was out of work and he gave me, he paid me for it. Anyway, John and his wife are eating cake and drinking the last of the milk that we've got, literally eating us out of house and home, literally. And Finally, about midnight, with children laying everywhere there was a flat spot to lay, John said, it's time to go home. And I said, well, I saw it. I couldn't say this. He should have said this two hours ago. It was midnight at least. Anyway, John and his wife stood with babies in their arms at the door and said, when we just got back from vacation, and we have decided before we left that we would swing by Ashland, go to service on Sunday night, and we would give the Jensen family all of the money we didn't spend while we were on vacation. Now friends, I'm two months behind on my car payment. We have no groceries in the house. And I don't have a clue today how much <coughs> was in that envelope that John handed us, but I no longer had. was behind in my car payment, and we have groceries in the house. I'll tell you folks, God will look out for you if you trust Him. He will look out for you.
getting on to three hours, aren't we? I still pray, God, you promised to Ashland to minister to this small congregation. And you are blessing the congregation. They're growing. They're learning. They're finding themselves richer in the spirit than they were before they were saved. But what's next? And I have no idea what was coming. I have no idea. My wife said to me, I no longer want to be a pastor's wife, and if you're going to do this, I want a divorce. So we drove to the district office for counsel. And the district superintendent, Harley Olson, and I agreed, or I wanted to keep my family together, so I made an agreement with him is what happened. And I said, I'll stay at the church until they get a new pastor, but I'm going to turn my credentials in. And they did. And all I could say is, Lord God, what are you doing? What's happening? Why is this happening? I believe I'm doing exactly what you want me to do, and you're pulling the rug out from under me. What is this? <laughs> I didn't know what I know now and what I'm going to share with you. In just a little while, and I don't know how little that while was at the moment, an ad appeared in the paper. It said, the Commission for the Airport of the Ashland Airport are taking applications for manager. <laughs> Friends, what do I have in my hand? I've got a federal license saying I can work on airplanes. And I've got some training on equipment. I know how to run a snowplow. I know how to fix them. I said, what have I got in my hand? So I applied. And was I devastated when I found out 28 other people applied as well? Well, the day came for the interview. And only two people showed up. One guy was very, very highly qualified. He'd been in the aviation business for years. All I had was two years of school and a federal license. That's all I had. He was first to be interviewed because of his qualifications. In about three minutes, he came out of the interview, and I looked at him. I said, well, is congratulations in order? And he said, no, they don't pay enough. There's only one person left. That's me. But I'll tell you something. That the, the board, the commission, and don't misunderstand me, I learned to love these men. But at that particular time, there was a Catholic board of commission, and they made it very clear that a Pentecostal minister has no idea how to run an airport. I mean, but they said to me, we haven't any choice, you're the only candidate. I don't know how you feel about that already, but it just thrills me when I think about it. So they hired me. Now the problem was I didn't have any money. And in order to take the job, a requirement of the job was that I had to be able to put aviation fuel in the gas tank in the ground so I could sell it to airplane pilots. I didn't have any money. Here again, God's got all this worked out ahead of time. <coughs> well, 
My next door neighbor was president of the bank, and he knew I was going to need money to take the job. He called me up and said, you stop at the bank and I'll give you a signature note for $3,000 and you can take the job. Uh, friends, does that excite you at all? It thrills me when I think about how God makes things happen. Well, all I can think of is the scripture that says all things work together for good to, lo to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But reason with me for just a minute. The scripture doesn't say my purpose. It says for his purpose. There is a reason why he works things out in our lives. And it's not for you and I. It's for his purpose. Well, I was, I was about, I would say about a year all by myself on the airport. Not doing too badly, but you know, managing, doing okay. And I was working on an airplane one day, and a car pulled up in front of my hangar door. Young man got out and said, hi, I'm Dan Gabler, and I want to come to work for you. Well. I said, Dan, I don't have any money to pay you with. I don't have enough work for just me alone. I said, you've got a good job driving a truck. Stay with it. Besides, Harley Hankstrom needs you. He doesn't want to hire another truck driver. He needs you. Well, Dan wasn't happy with that, but he left. Next week, he came by again. He said, both my wife, Rachel, and I were raised in Bolivia, South America, as missionary kids. He said, we came home, we're married, we've got two children, but I have no money to go to school with, and we both want to go back to the mission field. I said, Dan, I haven't got any money to pay you with. You need to stay with your truck driving job. Well, he left. Week number three, the car pulls up in front of my hangar again, and Dan stops by and he says, I want to start working for you. I want to be, I want to learn to be an aviation mechanic and a pilot. And I stopped and listened to him, I think, for the first time. Rather than think of what I couldn't do, I began to think of maybe there's something else besides just Dan, I said, let me pray about it. Give me one week to pray about this. Now, friends, I don't know how God gets through to this feeble mind and puts words in my mouth or ideas in my head. I do not know how all of that works. But the next week, Dan stopped by. And he said, I still want to work for you. And I'm going to read to you what I believe I said to him. It's as close as I can get. Oh, I've got to go to a different page. Here's what I'm pretty sure I said to him. It's pretty close. I said, Dan, I will hire you. I will pay you $7 an hour. That doesn't sound like much today. But back then, this is 1974, I think. Pretty good pay. I said, when we have work. And I said, if we have no work, you will not be required to come in. And I said, you can use my airplanes to learn to fly. I had nothing to base any of that on. Nothing. I didn't have any money. I didn't have, I had an airplane. I had two airplanes. And that's all. I didn't have anything. But I knew 
I knew, I knew, I knew that God was saying, hire this man. For the next 30 years, I was a Snap-on dealer, or I worked for Snap-on Tools Corporation. God takes care of his own. Now, I want you to think about it for a minute. I don't want you to miss the point. Someone gave me a book. That book pointed me to Spartan School of Aeronautics. Rudy gave me a, a, the ability to use his shop his customers, his tools, and and, act, and keep whatever money I made. He didn't want any of it. I went to school in Spartan. I moved to Ashland because I believed it was right. I was given a job as airport manager, manager, the least qualified candidate, and Dan and Rachel became missionaries to Africa for the next 30 years. Why did I go to Ashland? Why did I even go to Spartan? I believe God's purpose was for Dan and Rachel, not for me. It was, I wasn't supposed to go, but they were. And it was just a small part of God's plan that I had to help them. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now that does not mean be nosy. That doesn't mean meddle where you shouldn't. It means look at how you can help, how you can benefit others, especially the household of faith. Eventually, my <coughs> wife left. Things went okay, at least at first. I had three kids. But when the last one went off to school, to college, it was a tough valley to crawl through, I'll tell you. But God even watches when we're in the valley. Many times, and you may not know this radio station, but there's a little country town in northern Wisconsin, and they've got a tall radio tower, and they've got a, a gospel station that just preaches the gospel and sends music out over the airwaves, and many, many times I would be driving from one appointment to another, listening to WWIB. In worship, the overwhelming presence of God would fill my van. And oftentimes I would have to pull over and just praise God and worship, bless His name and thank Him for His goodness. And friends, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like the blessed Holy Spirit to come alongside of you and warm you and comfort you and fill your heart with praise and give you strength to move when you don't think that there's any movement to be had. The Holy Spirit can move in your heart and life like no human can. One Saturday morning, my telephone rang. To this day, I don't know how she found my phone number. The story was sad, and the message was sad, to the point, to, it was to the point from somebody that I really didn't know. 
He had married, this, this, this lady had married my best friend, James G. King Jr. But he died yesterday morning. I prayed with her, and that was what I thought was going to be the end. A year and a half later, I was talking with someone in the Minnesota district office, and I cannot remember who. And he said to me, or she, whoever it was, I don't recall, for some reason, they just brought it up. They said, uh, do you know that Meredith is not doing well? No. But did it go dead? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm probably about to have to handle it anyway. Uh, but they said Meredith isn't doing well. Now keep in mind, this is unsolicited information. I didn't ask. But I was interested because I knew she was married to my best friend. A fellow I roomed with and loved very much. His father was a professor at North Central Bible College. A man I loved. A man who gave me advice and helped me and strengthened me in ways that uh, no one else has. Humanly. But Jim died. And Meredith was alone and not doing well. So... I did what any natural person would do who wants to help others. I wrote her a little card and I stuck out a tape in the card that had some music on it that really ministered to me when I was in the valley. And I thought, this can't hurt. Well, I got a letter back saying, mind your own business. <laughs> you can laugh at that because we do now. But she wrote to me. Now think about that. She actually wrote back, which means I had to actually write back. <laughs> right? I mean, you can't let it, let it go unanswered. How many of you get emails or texts and say, oh, I've got to answer that right away? Right? So I wrote her back. Well, that began about a year and a half of letter writing. And... The condensed version is that uh, she and Jim had a nine-year-old son. My children are gone. They've been raised. They're off doing their thing. I'm alone. Maybe I can help with Jim, James. James G. King III. Maybe we can help each other. So we married. James is now 39 years old. He has served our country in Afghanistan and in uh, Iraq. Using the only thing I had in my hand, and that was what little bit that I could offer. James became my stepson. I call him my son. Very proud of him. But do you remember the name Angus Sanis that we started out with? She was one of the pioneers of this congregation way back. Angus Sanis is the grandmother of James G. King III. You see where I'm going with this? We live in such a small world. God gives us grace. He gives us peace. He gives us joy. He gives us warmth of heart. He strengthens us. He provides for us. He is our source, folks. You don't know today what God can do through you, with you, and for you, until in faith you yield to Him what is in your hand. All you have to give Him is what He has given you. 
You give it back to him, and he multiplies it. He makes a plus sign out of it. Remember Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Though amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings and name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Sing that again with me. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much for letting me be here and share with you the blessings, the privilege of serving God.